Jonathan, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Good to good to be here. Thanks for having me on. No, thank you for thank you for coming, mate. It still still blows my mind that people agree to come on and, and talk about their career paths <laughs> and because I'd imagine you're a busy man. So no, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Um many questions I've got about obviously your your career and, and things that you've done, but I'm always curious with people in the acting industry. Was it what you always wanted to do when you were at school? Was it the career path that, that you always seen yourself in? No, no, no. it wasn't. No, it, uh, uh, the, the decision to, to go for it uh, came when I was about about 19. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I should explain it. The, the, the reason I get interested in drama and involved in it was <clears throat> my dad came home one night and he said, uh, look, there's a junior course at the Royal Scottish Academy. Mm -hmm. Of music and drama, do you want to give it a go? Right. And uh, I went along, it was a Saturday morning thing. It was two hours on a Saturday morning and an hour on Wednesday after school. Right. I went along the Saturday and I loved it. Mm -hmm. I really, really enjoyed it. And uh, and I went, I, I was there from about, I was 10 to I was about 17. Right. Wow. But uh, in the early stages of that, when I was about 11, 12, what used to happen was if, if the BBC or anybody were casting anything that required kids, they would come along the Saturday and sit up the back. And if they thought you might be right for the part, you would read for them. Mm -hmm. And I was I was lucky enough to get quite a bit of work out of that. Right. And I did when I was about from about twelve to fourteen, I did quite a, a lot of uh T V work, mm -hmm. mainly for BBC uh up here and also down in London. So I'd uh, I, I knew that side of things. Yep. Uh, but I had no intention of following it through as a career, and I was actually I, I was set to go into the world of advertising. Right. Believe it or not, my, my dad. That's what my dad was involved in. Right. And uh, I completed a summer's job, a summer job mm -hmm. up in uh, not far from here, actually, up in Park Circus, and at the end of it. They gave they offered me a full time position, right? And I I knocked it back because all my all my mates were going back to do a six year, so I did a six year, which was a waste of time. <laughs> and uh, but the, at the end of it, uh, I I thought no, I'm I quite fancy this, and I went to do a, a course mm -hmm. uh, that was focusing mainly on copywriting, right? In in advertising, so I was set to do that. And halfway through the course, I got a call from the BBC right. saying. Would you, would you be keen to do this play that we're doing? And it re it needed three weeks off the course, mm -hmm. and I asked for the time off. Now they give me, it. and uh, I, I spoke to my dad about it, and he said, "Well, what do you, what do you want to do?" I said, I "Quite like to do that." Mm -hmm. like. He said, ah, "Just do it." Then. <laughs> so I dogged it for three weeks with his <laughs> approval, and at the end of it, uh, when I when I remember coming out and getting the bus from. Um, Botanic Gardens down at St George's Cross where it was brought up there. Uh, I remember passing Queen Margaret Drive and seeing the, the building and I thought, no, that's, that's what I want to do. Right. And I went into the to the drama college which was in the old St George's Place, Nelson mm -hmm. Mandela Place. And I went in the next day and I got an audition for, one of the last auditions actually for that next year's intake. Right. And I got in and... Uh, was there for three years, so that's that's how it started. That's a stroke of fate there. Stroke of fate, yeah, yeah. So uh, that's how it got involved. So yeah. At any point, do you think I could have been doing advertising? I could have been. I could well, have been a totally know, different path. Well, yeah, but I don't. I don't <laughs> give it a lot of thought. But no, that that was that was the that's the way it was gonna it was gonna go, and uh, I'd have been mm -hmm. more than happy to do it. Yeah, uh, and uh, I still, in fact, you know that the. the the, the chap that offered me the job was a it was a pal of my dad's and he passed away in the summer there, John right. Cherry. So uh, I still kept in touch with him. Right. In all these Brilliant. years. So there you go. That's amazing. And obviously when you then when you're at college and I've had a few different people from the industry and they've spoke kind of very different experiences of going through that college environment and and how they found it. Did you enjoy it? What did you get out of it yeah. when you went and studied? I loved it. I loved right. every single minute of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've heard all kind, and yeah. a lot of folk didn't enjoy it. A mm -hmm. lot of folk, but uh, I, I I viewed it in a way you, you you got out of it what you put into. It. Yeah, and uh, I wasn't going to be thrown by MD 
you know, throwing a wobbler or anything like yeah. that. I, I, and in fact, you know, I only missed one day in the three years. Jeez. A dodgy curry <laughs> for the Koh <laughs> put me to bed. <laughs> uh, but I absolutely loved it. And, right. uh, and the, the three years, just towards the end, of, when you were about to leave, it was just, you knew then it was right time to, to yeah. leave and, and get out and, uh, and start doing it for real. And do you feel it gave you that kind of good grounding for step them out into the world of additions and yeah. then different things, different challenges. Very, very much so. Uh, I mean, I, I uh, when I left college, it, you, it was it was slightly different. Well, it was very different actually because you had to have an equity card, right, to get a job. Ah, right, okay. Can you, can you get a job with an equity card? Right. So, uh, I got my equity card from the Citizens Theatre. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a, a theatre and education division called TAG right. Theatre about Glasgow, which I think is still yeah still going strong. Uh, but when I left in 79, that was a really, uh, it was a really good company to work with. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember Ian Woldridge, actually, who was the artistic director, he came and uh, and spoke to the whole of the final year, uh, just before we, we graduated. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, being really inspired by him. He was, he was a fantastic, well, he's, still, he's still alive, he's a fantastic yeah. guy. And I thought, God, I'd love to work with him. Mm -hmm. and, and I ended up, I got a call from him and he said, I want you to come in and read for a part, read for the part. I said, I don't have an equity card. He said, we've got a spare one. I'll give it to you. And that's how I got started. So, yeah, yeah. But uh, no, I, I, I love my time at college. Mm -hmm. I really did. Made a, a lot of good friends and uh, I, I, learned, I, I learned a lot. It yeah. was a really good good grounding. Mm -hmm. I mean, God, when, I, when I went, I'd never been to see a play. I'd never seen a play in the theatre before. Well, that's what I was going to ask. Did you have an interest in the theatre at that point? Or no, really? I'd, I'd been in two productions. When I was at junior course, I'd been in two productions mm -hmm. uh, they, they needed a kid for. But I'd never seen a play before. Right, okay. Uh, <laughs> Judges <laughs> Cross. <laughs> but I'm in the well, there's a the metaphor around the corner, but I never, uh, I'd been there. But uh, so I, I, learned, I learned a lot from yeah. being there. And I, 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 uh, I loved every minute of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when you left then... Was at that point were you thinking it was going to be theatre for you, or were you thinking about TV, or what? What was your plans at that you just point? Think, I think you just think about work. Yeah, you know, you want to yeah. just uh, work as much as you can. Mm -hmm. the, the kind of cycle at that point was uh, you would do theatre uh, in the autumn, uh, panto in the mm -hmm. in the Christmas time, yeah. and then theatre again, and in the summer. There, you you try to get a drama, right? You know, because that's when the, the that's when they would make the up in BBC Scotland. That's mm -hmm. when they would make the dramas like Play for Today. Mm -hmm. Or I did when I came out, I uh, I did Cloud Howe, which is the same part of since uh, Lewis Grass at Gibbons Scott Square. I right. did that, uh, and then it was about let me see early early eighties. I did a play uh, for the Scottish Theatre Company. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I did a few of them actually, but I did this particular one, and uh, in the cast was a guy called Ron Bain. Right. And at that point, he was working with Colin Gilbert, mm -hmm. who had set up the comedy unit in BBC Scotland. Right. And Ron was in Kick Up the Eighties, laughing nearly paid my license fee, mm -hmm. and the the sort of early beginnings of Naked Radio. Right. And he recommended me to Colin. Right. And that's how I went in. To, to see them mm -hmm. to to read for something and uh, that was that's how i got involved with them and that was and up until fairly recently i've still been involved with the comedy i mean colin's retired now but yeah uh, that's how i met philip differ and mm -hmm. uh i knew elaine from drama college yeah. and elaine and i had we'd worked with 784 mm -hmm. together prior to joining the comedy unit yeah um and i'd worked with andy gray so uh it was it was you know a, a good time to you know to work in TV and yeah. particularly in the comedy unit. Yeah. But I didn't I didn't set out with that as my goal or anything like yeah. that. It just that's how it all fell yeah, into place. Yeah, that was the path. That was the way it all happened. You know. How did you find the the audition process? Because there's, I suppose from your point of view, it'd be hard to describe to someone that can of going for jobs and going for parts and you might hear back, you might not hear back, you yeah. might get it and it's your constant cycle, but it must be hard to keep yourself motivated in that space all the time. Well, that's, that's certainly, that's true. And it's the one, it's one thing 
that they don't warn you about at drama college. They mm -hmm. don't, they, you you know, you had to, I learned that myself. Right. But, you know, the, what you've got to deal with, uh, and it doesn't matter what level you're at, mm -hmm. you, you've you got to be able to deal with rejection. Yeah. That's, you've got yeah. to be able to be thick-skinned enough to, mm -hmm. to deal with that. Uh, the addition process, when I, when I, it's, that is the one area that has changed so much mm -hmm. uh, since I left college because, you know, you get a call, you know, go along to Queen Margaret Drive, there's a drama, uh, the parts such and such. Yeah. Uh, and that's all you knew. So you'd, you'd arrive, you'd be given about two or three pages of script. Right. You went in and you read it and that was it. Sometimes you, sometimes you got it, sometimes you didn't. Now, the process, because, uh, and this, this has been, um, it's more so now because of COVID and, yeah. and lockdown, but you, you tape now, you don't, mm -hmm. you, you very seldom see people face to face yeah. that we are. Uh, you, you tape, there's all kinds of self tape apps mm -hmm. that can make it look like quite a polished yeah. presentation, but, um, and you've got to learn it, you know, yeah. you, you've got to learn it. And yeah. that, you know, the thing, the difference now is, you know, when, when anybody self tapes, whether they be just out of college or mm -hmm. my age, yeah, you, you've pretty much got to hit performance level, yeah, to put yourself in my shirt getting the part, mm -hmm. and that's the big difference because back in late seventies, early eighties, you know, you just you're probably reading it for the second time off a bit of paper, yeah, you just rocked up and just rocked up, you know, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So that is the that is the out of all the sort of changes, I think that is the one that's that's uh, mm -hmm. it's high up there is the addition process. Do you prefer the the way it is now, or do you prefer the way it was? Prefer the way it is now. Yeah, it's much yeah. better, mm -hmm. and uh, you know you get more information. You get a clearer idea mm -hmm. of what they're looking for, and uh, and by self taping as well. You know, if you're not happy with the first take, the second take, you keep going until yeah. you get it right. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're doing, you know, going back to what it was like, yeah, uh, you you to nail it. I there suppose you only get one shot, haven't you? You one shot. Right. And, you know, that's the tricky thing because it's all about choices. Mm -hmm. You make a choice about how to play it. Yeah. It may not be what they're looking for. I suppose that's still true with the self-taping process, but that, it was, I think it was much more difficult mm -hmm. to, to get it right the way it was. Do you remember the kind of first rejection that you got or the first time it kind of affected yeah, you? Yeah, I do. I, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, well, I, I, my first few years, uh, even when I was doing Naked Video, which mm -hmm. was, you know, it's on the network, Aye, it's a really good huge. gig to get. Uh, I would fire out wee letters all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, that you know, anything you could see, you got a sniff of, Aye. I'm reading a letter. And I had a process. <laughs> I would uh, I would have a CV, typed out CV. Right. I get somebody in my dad's office to type it up for me. So type CV. I'd have a postcard size photograph right. of me. And then I stamped addressed the envelope, right? Right. And I always made the stamped address the envelope quite small so they couldn't return the photo. <laughs> so they would keep it on file. That was the thing behind it. Until one day I get one back from, uh, there used to be a rep company down in Air, Air Gaty. Right. I think they're called the Victor Graham players. Victor something players. Maybe Victor Graham sounds as if he was sold second hand cars, but <laughs> uh, he the the this theater company they did a summer season right and I thought I quite fancy that doing in there for the summer right. a few mates that lived down there so I sent off all my stuff just as I described <laughs> it and I got a letter of re rejection plus he taken the photograph which was postcard size and he cut about half an inch <laughs> off either side so he could fit it back into the envelope yes. <laughs> uh, so I remember that that's the that was the first sort of big rejection. <laughs> Do, do they get easier? Obviously, that as you say, like the higher you go, that there will still be points where you don't get a job. But do you ever get used to it, or is it always kind of stab at you a wee bit when you don't get something you really wanted? I don't let it bother me at all. Yeah. Uh, the way I look at it is, you don't want me, you're lost. Yeah. Now that's yeah. soon. Maybe people listen to think that sounds arrogant. Cause mm -hmm. I'm not an arrogant person. Yeah. But you've got to think that. Yeah. Because if you don't want me, I don't want you. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and yeah, it's sort of, you know, it's just a mental thing. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's like you know, if if I do go in for a, a sit down uh, with somebody, I, I I 
I've got a, a way of working it in my head so mm -hmm. that I don't feel as if this is the be all and an end yeah. all. But yeah. you, so uh, you've just got to brush it off, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I don't let it bother me at all. Yeah, I really I just you know drop it. Best way to be. Best way to be. Hundred percent. You know. So was there a was there a, a part or a kind of show or a moment for you where you kind of felt justified? in choosing that career path was there a kind of point where you're like this is this is going to work for me this is where i want to be i did a i did a job uh and i was about a couple of years out of drama college i'd been doing tag mm -hmm. i've been working at traverse doing it borderline yep and um the i mentioned earlier the scottish theater company well when it, it was initially set up it was quite a big mm -hmm. big deal it's the equivalent of the National Theatre Scotland yeah. just now. Although they didn't enjoy the same goodwill <laughs> in press <laughs> reviews that, that they do. But um, they, they, they were set up. And I remember I actually, I got an interview with a guy. It was an English actor called Ewan Hooper. Right. Who was the artistic director initially. Then Tom Fleming took it over. Mm -hmm. But Ewan Hooper was was there and he was good enough to see me. I mean, didn't know me for, for Adam, but had me up. The offices were up off part circus. And I went in to see him. He said, look, he said, I've got nothing just now. He said, but we'll keep you in mind. Yeah. Yeah, it's fair enough. And a few weeks later, I get I get this call. Can mm -hmm. I get down to Washington Street Arts Centre? Right. And the there was a play in rehearsal written and directed by Bill Bryden mm -hmm. and starring Philip Mackay. Right. Uh, and a host of other fantastic Scottish actors. A young Phyllis Logan was in it. Right. Uh, yeah. But it was just, it was, it was a fantastic cast. Mm -hmm. Absolutely brilliant. And what had happened was there was a young actor in it playing uh, Fulton's Apprentice. Right. It was about the Clyde Bank Blitz. Right, okay. And uh, there was a, a, a young guy in it who, for whatever reason, walked. Right. After the first week. Mm -hmm. Walked on the Thursday. And I went down to see him on the Friday. Just right. before they broke for the weekend. And... Uh, it's one of the few occasions that this has happened, but I went went in. Of course, you're kind of phased, you know, uh, Mackay out of porridge, aye, you know, and a whole load of others. And Bill Bryan, obviously, I knew who he was and mm -hmm. what a fantastic, aye. talented writer and director he was. And uh, sat down at the table, read with Fort Mackay, a uh, couple of scenes. And Bill goes, yeah, that's great. Uh, you want to do it? And, and I said, <laughs> yeah, 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 and he said, uh, "Well, okay, come on, we'll go and get a bit of lunch." And so we went for a, a bit of lunch. I think just a pint of lager. You must have uh, been in dreamland at this point. Yeah, I was like, you know, I was a <laughs> kid, you know, and uh, it was. I was just knocked out. And I remember <laughs> being so excited to tell my mum and dad, and that was a real learning process mm -hmm. working with people like Thornton I mentioned and Phyllis, but. Johnny Grieve, Jan Wilson, uh, John Young and Paul Young, um, and a guy called Roy Hanlon, mm -hmm. who was uh, a fantastic Scots actor. Maybe not a household name, yeah. but highly regarded uh -huh. up here. And uh, I learned so much from working mm -hmm. with all these guys. And uh, I mean, I was I was rotten when I started out. And I wasn't very good. Because I, rem I always remember the... It was really, it was pretty nerve wracking, and because um, these guys were real heavyweights, yeah. you know. And uh, how do you go over that though? If you're if you're well, in you there just, performing with them, you just do it. You've got to do it. This is the this is the this is what you want to do. And I always remember one of the girls doing props, uh, coming round to when we finished in the theatre royal, finished the tour, and she said, um, she's been lovely working with you. She's you're you're really good in this. You're really good. She said, because in the beginning you weren't it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but that was, that was a huge job for me because, um, uh, Roy Hanlon recommended me to his London agent. Right. Based on your performance. And, yeah. Right. And, okay. Uh, so I went down and, and met them mm -hmm. and that, you know, that was a big, yeah, big step in the right direction. And I'm still, Believe it or not, I'm still with the agency today. Uh, but he recommended me to them, and uh, it was, you know, that's when things always kind of 
clicked and changed yeah. as well. Which is amazing, though, because that all stems from that guy walking off. Yeah, I know. And then you coming in. And, I know. But that's that's what it is. See, when you were working with, and obviously you've, you've, you've spoke about some of them there when you were younger, like some real heavyweights, did you... Did you spend time watching these guys? Did you ask them for advice or anything? Did you just watch how they'd done things? And I, uh, yeah, well, I suppose so. I, 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 um, I learned a lot working with, with Fulton about, mm -hmm. you know, about, I mean, I had a pretty good idea about stage awareness and I knew my way around this, in a stage, Aye. but watching him and the way he stood and, and sort of commanded the stage, um, mm -hmm. uh, he used to say, he said, I mean, pardon, forgive the language, but he used to say, he said, I say, he said, just stand there like that, like your boss hanging out. <laughs> and it was, the, he, made, he said it because it was a sort of, he put it down as sort of a Greek theatre thing, they had to stand and, right. and, and, uh, and really show themselves. <laughs> so that was the, uh, no, I'm not saying I'd do that every time I'm on stage, but that was the, uh, that was one of the things. But no, I, I learned so much from these guys. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean, I, you know, by the t I mean, that girl was right. By the end of it, I was so comfortable yeah. in the part, you know. And I suppose it's good with the way she'd give you that feedback as well. It was just like kind of honest, you were bad at the start, but you've turned yeah. it around. And I suppose that's the things that will mean the most to you as a young, yeah. up and coming kind of person in that industry that you're like, oh, I've actually turned that around there. Yeah. From, from when I came in the door and then joining that agency on the back of someone recommending you from that as well, your confidence must go through the roof. Yeah. It's, at that it, point. It was, uh, yeah, but you still, you know, you still get to keep your feet in the ground yeah. or that, but it was, it was a big, big thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Love that. <laughs> was there any, aside the Greek comparison, <laughs> any bits of advice that kind of stood out for you over the years that you got from people that you've, you still kind of use or you still keep in your mind today? Yeah. Actually stems from that job. It was uh, um I hope the language is okay. No, you're fine. Uh, you're fine. But I, I remember when I when I was uh, when I when we started rehearsals for that, um Roy Hanlon took me aside one afternoon uh, with the premise of going over my lines. Right. And 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 his as well, as I <laughs> right. said, but he knew his but it was really, it was nothing to do with lines because I knew my lines, but mm -hmm. it, it was obviously just to sort of give me some advice because Bill used to speak in sort of football terms all the time. Right. He would say, right, you, 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 he's, he's going to pass the ball to you. You've got to run with that line, you know, <laughs> and then you got to hop it across and bang back of the pokey, all that, all this kind of stuff. And I know Big Roy said, he said, and you know, Bill's absolutely right. You know, it's teamwork and all that and uh, you know, passing the ball and, and, and heading it in the back of the net, but I uh, never forget. When the curtain goes up on that first night, every man for his fucking self. <laughs> and I tell you, never a truer word spoke. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. You really had to be able to look after yourself. And I suppose so. that's like an, uh, that's something that you probably wouldn't learn at college either. No. That's like an, uh, no. in at the deep end. That's, that's, that was Roy's advice. And uh, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was it was the best advice you could give. It's fantastic. <laughs> Yeah. Do you think there's parallels between the way everything is behind the scenes for theatre to TV? Is it the same sort of dynamic behind the scenes or is it a different kind of set of challenges for you? Oh, it's a well, it's, it's a completely different, uh, it's a completely different gig, you know, mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, it's, you know, the, the detail, you know, the, there's a sort of, uh, uh, what's the best way to describe it? It's slightly not heightened, but there's a there's a way of working within yeah. you know the, the stage. Whereas with uh, with TV, the camera's right there. Mm -hmm. It's got to be so depending on what you're doing. You know, yeah. Obviously, with a sketch show, you can mm -hmm. you know play about with it a bit more, but you've got to you've really got to keep it mm -hmm. and 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 make it real. Yeah. You know, so it's a, it's a completely set different set of disciplines mm -hmm. uh so yeah do you have a preference no that i the, the one one of the things that i enjoy uh about i still enjoy about um my work is that i try and keep it varied mm -hmm. yeah uh, and you know i'm i'm planning to go back and uh to do theater later this year mm -hmm. uh and i'm also doing 
uh, television work before that. But I'll, I'll in, enjoy them both, yeah. taste them both. Yeah. But I'll, I like the variety of it all, mm -hmm. you know? Well, that's the thing so, I was curious about as well, because... I know you've you've done some shows for your, like one man shows and when you're talking about every man for himself, there must be a pressure that comes when you're the only person that the film yeah. place is watching and you've got to remember everything. But you enjoy that that I, side I, of things. Yeah, I do enjoy it. Uh, the, the I did a a, a one man show last year, mm -hmm. which we're hoping to bring back. Actually, it was uh, called Man's Best Friend by Douglas Maxwell. And it was at Oren Oren Moore mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, you know that, that you've got a very short rehearsal yeah. time for that, mm -hmm. and and I was a little bit um, at the beginning, first couple of days, a little bit underprepared. Yeah. Uh, but then once you get on it, yeah, uh, and then you're away, and it was one of the most rewarding mm -hmm. experiences because it's he's such a talented writer, Douglas, and uh, to be able to do his stuff is is yeah. great. So so, but. It does come out. I mean, there is a real pressure. Don't mm -hmm. get, don't get me wrong. And, yeah. and you you've really got to be on it. Yeah. But it is really rewarding when mm -hmm. you you know you can if you can hold the audience. Yeah. And uh, no, I, I love it. Yeah. I absolutely love it. Yeah. Because I would imagine some people could crumble in that environment. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I suppose so. But you know what? You know, it's you've got it at the same time. You know, you're not saving lives. No. You know, you yeah. know the coal face, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, so you've got to have, yeah, you can't get too absorbed. In yeah. It, you know, so like you just go out and do your thing. and You do your thing. And, uh, you know, if there's a wee hiccup, half the folk will not even notice. Yeah. You know? yeah. No, I know. That is very true. Very true. Um, TV side of things, obviously, I need I need to ask you about only an excuse. It's a, yeah, yeah. It is a, a staple diet in Scotland for the last... 20, 25 years. No, we, we first did it in 86. Jeez. Did you see it having the impact that it did when you started it? None of us did. No? None of us did. I mean, the only thing, looking back, the, it was it was the first time that there had been anything, uh, any kind of programme linking football and comedy. Yeah. yeah. Know, this is before off the, off the ball and yeah. all that. You know, it was... Um, so that you know, we knew we'd, we'd you know, if we could make it work, it would, mm -hmm. you know, it should do a trick, mm -hmm. but uh, we, we didn't see it going for as long as it did, yes, yeah. uh, absolutely not. And 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 to enjoy the success that it did, we never saw that. How did who come up with the idea in the first place? Was it just like a Philip Duffer, right? It's Philip Duffer, mm -hmm. uh, Philip, we, we the, the two of us were huge fans of our. A program called Only a Game, mm -hmm. which was a, a documentary uh, made by Mike Alexander. And it was written and narrated by William McIlvaney, mm -hmm. who's got a very distinctive voice. Yeah. So I used to take him off when we were doing naked radio rehearsals right. and stuff like that. And then Philip got the idea, I said, why don't we do a parody of it? So he went, <laughs> this show, this is, I love telling this story because, uh, and I'll explain why later. But he went to, a guy called Stan Taylor, who was then head of Radio Scotland. Right. And he said, Stan, listen, I've got an idea to do a, a parody of Only a Game. Mm -hmm. I'm going to call it Only an Excuse. And Johnny's going to be in it and I'm going to ask Tony. And I'll write it along with Patson and, and Bob Black. And uh, I think it might work a trick. Any chance of getting some money to make a pilot? Mm -hmm. And Stan took a drag of his embassy <laughs> tips and went, I'll tell you what, Paul, forget the pilot. We made the programme. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> Jeez. That was it. Now, the reason I tell that story is because if that was in the last 10 years, yeah. chances are the program would never have been made. Yeah, you'd have to probably pilot it and then who knows. What they would have said was, we said, eh, all right, okay, can we see a script? No. So they were a script and they're going, they're going back and forth with changes and changes mm -hmm. and changes and changes. And eventually you'd have lost the will to live <laughs> and it would have probably ended up on a shelf. <laughs> but they, back then, mm -hmm. back then, that's what these guys were paid for, make these decisions. Aye. Aye. And he said, no, that sounds like a good idea. I'm going to make the programme. So there you go. So it's Philip's idea. And I was more than delighted to be part yeah. of it. And, you know, Tony only did it for a few years, but we had such, I mean, it was such a laugh. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, although Tony stopped doing it and there was no fallout or anything like yeah. that, we still keep in touch and good pals. Mm -hmm. 
Um, he just didn't want to do it anymore. Yeah. And um, and I didn't. I think in a way it was easier for Philip. Phil, Phil, I think Philip found it easier to write for me. Right. And uh, and it just kind of grew from strength to strength mm -hmm. after that. And uh, and we've had some love, you know, cracking people join us over the years. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, it was it was a great program to do, but mm -hmm. it's it's done now. So yeah, that's it. How is the interaction with the people that you were doing the impressions of? Because obviously some of them became massive, like Frank McAvenny, Barry Ferguson. You had all these different ones, but. Did any of them ever speak to you about it? Did you ever see any of them? What was the chat like? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because we, we used to, uh, we'd be invited to go along to speak at the different football dinners mm -hmm. at the end of the season and stuff like that, or, or sponsors Aye. dues and stuff. So, you know, I've I've done done it in front of them. Aye. I'm all like, <laughs> uh, like Soonis and Aye. Del Gleish and Law mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, and, and I think I've done it in front, uh, in front of Frank as well, mm -hmm. um, but they, they they were all great. Aye. I'm sure. Listen, I'm sure there's a few of them whose noses were out of joint. But the thing, you know, a good joke will always hurt somebody oh, in some aye. way. Aye. But what we used to always do is we used to gauge it by this: that we'd say the joke, and mm -hmm. if that person was to walk in that door there mm -hmm. right after we told it, how would we feel? Aye. So if we aye, felt if aye. we were embarrassed by it, we thought mm -hmm. that's too much. That's aye. it's embarrassing us. It must be really bad. <laughs> so, uh, but no, they take it. They they, they all take it great. They 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 were. In fact, when we we decided to bring the program to a close, mm -hmm. I came up with, with the suggestion that why don't we ask Walt and mm -hmm. Kenny and, and and Graham if they want to be part of it aye. and Chick as well mm -hmm. and. Uh, and and Chick, I think it was Chick for, for he contacted them, mm -hmm. and right away the three of them said love to, brilliant, you know. So uh, uh, no, and and I've done it in Fergie as well. He <laughs> he, he says I can't do him. He goes I oh, can't do me, <laughs> can't do me. Ryan Giggs can do me. So that, <laughs> that's it. Did you have a? Obviously, you done loads of them with, within that time. But was there a character that you enjoyed? Uh, yeah, the, 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 I mean, I enjoyed doing them, them all. Yeah. And then also, if it was a really good joke, you know, yeah. you, you couldn't wait to do it. Mm -hmm. But I suppose looking back, you know, having a bit of time now to sort of assess it all, I think uh, Dennis was yeah. one of the favourites because Philip used to write such a rambling nonsense, <laughs> which was, I mean, a complete hoot to do. <laughs> and uh, and the, the other thing was Dennis, because the programs, when the programme started out, it wasn't a program about mimicry. Yeah. The only voice, I think, the only voices that were on it in the first, the first program was me as Mac Ovani and me as doing Dennis Law, mm -hmm. and uh, because he, you know, that voice that you know Aberdeen via Manchester Aye. via Huddersfield via Torino, <laughs> it was just such a laugh. And and I've obviously met him and gotten. I mean, he was he very. I was very kindly invited. To Aberdeen when he became a freeman of the city, right? So he can his nose couldn't have been out of joint too much. So. <laughs> oh, mine was Barry Ferguson. Was it? No, oh, see that. I think I think Barry may have been a wee bit annoyed <laughs> at times, but uh, however, hopefully not too much. <laughs> oh, I love that. Um, more of a general question, but I'm all, I'm always intrigued when I've got people on and they're, they're talking about their career. Was there or you might still have, was there anybody that you've had that's been a kind of mentor to you over over your career or somebody that you can always go to if you need advice on something or you were, you uh, were unsure? Yeah, it used to be Roy Hanlon. Right. It used to be a guy called Roy Hanlon uh, who passed away, probably, I don't know, I think Roy must be dead about 15, 16 years now. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so he was, uh, he was somebody I would seek yeah. I mean, I still, if I've got, a, 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 I'm puzzled about something or I want a second opinion, uh, I'll happily ask Philip's yeah. advice. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, apart from working with him all these years, you know, we're good pals, but I would, uh, if it was a work-related thing, I'd quite happily uh, mm -hmm. check out him as well. So, yeah. And do you still go with, and again, much like the college thing, there's kind of different answers on this, when you get a, a script in or you've got the, 
opportunity to go for something. Do you really think about it before you say yes or no, or do you go on gut instinct, or how? what's your process for kind of potentially taking a part? Bit of both, actually. Right. Yeah, a bit of both. Uh, the... I probably I'd probably say I lean to gut instinct. Right. More than more than anything. Mm-hmm. You know? Uh but you know, I'll I'll, I'll if something comes in, mm-hmm. I'll you know, I'll, I'll go over it and yeah. you know, do all the prep and see what it's like and everything. Mm-hmm. But um maybe gut instinct just edges <laughs> it. Anything that you've not back that you then look back on and go, oh, I wish I'd have took that. Uh is there anything? Probably dismissed it out of my head <laughs> if, if there has been. I'm sure there's probably been a couple of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's been a couple of things I haven't been able to do. Uh, it's just the way the dates have gone. Yeah. But uh, looking back, I wasn't all that mm-hmm. fussed. So, yeah, either way. Yeah, uh, either way. So um can't think of anything I'll find. It'll come mm. to me when I'm <laughs> driving back up the road. Well, up the road. I always ask people as well, also we speak about, all these kind of high points for you that, you that you've had, but was there any real kind of tough parts during your, your kind of acting career that you've, maybe things haven't been going so well or you've not had the jobs you're looking for and, and how do you cope with that side of things? The, the Yeah, I suppose, so I think, you know, the, everybody hits uh, periods where, you know, mm. the, you, it's, it's not rough, but uh, I mean, I've always been lucky. I've always known that there's going to be something to, to go to, Aye. but there was a, uh, there was a time, there was a, a, a few years uh, when I had been asked, I was doing, the work I was doing didn't enable me to do any theatre work. Right. And uh, I got offered, you know, offers came in to do theatre and I couldn't do it because of the way that these other jobs were mm-hmm. scheduled. And uh, and it's the same old story. If you knock things back, people just stop. Yeah. You do it two, three times, people just don't come back. So... I, I found myself, I thought, this isn't good, this, I, mm-hmm. I need to do something. It was beginning to really, yeah. really bug me. And uh, I made a concentrated effort mm-hmm. to get back in. And uh, um, yeah, it was actually, I, I did a really good job at the Tron. Mm-hmm. Uh, Andy Arnold gave me a, a, a part and he was doing a production of Three Sisters. Right. And that kick-started it again. Mm-hmm. So I, I owe, owe Andy a, a lot for that. And is it, I suppose then it's, it must be hard being in that position of you feel like you're sitting on the outside looking in and it's the pressure of trying to get back in, but you don't want to jump at the first thing that, that comes. Either it's picking, I suppose it's picking the right thing to to come back into for you. Yeah, I think if you're, if you're uh, you know, beggars can kind of be choosers yeah. as well. You yeah. know, there's that, there's that side of things, but uh no, I was I was very forced. This was a this was a good uh, a good part and a good production mm-hmm. with very very good actors. So, yeah, uh, you, you, you know it was it was a no brainer. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know if you try if you try if you if, if you find if I you know an actor finds that they maybe they they should they feel they should be getting you know a chance at such and such a part. Yeah, you know you know and they're not doing anything. Mm-hmm. Take what there is and then make the best Aye. of it, you know, I would say. Aye. Yeah. No, and I suppose that's a hard thing for people because you maybe get people that have got the preconception that, well, I'm not doing that. Or I don't, I don't want to do that job. But as you say, if you knock back three or four, then... Yeah, I'd, I'll be honest with you. I I, uh, I think if you were to look back over my career, and I've, I've been doing this for over 40 years now, mm-hmm. I haven't knocked back all that much. Aye. You know? Aye. But just with that approach, though, of oh, I can't yeah, knock it back. Yeah, I do. I mean, you know, it's uh, people are, who do are obviously in quite a privileged position. Right. And uh, Aye. you know, but if you're a, if you're a, a job in actor and work in actor, you know, you sh- mm-hmm. if someone comes up, oh, you do it. Yeah. You know, um, I, I make suppose the best of it. It works. I suppose it works both ways because you can get a job that's maybe not ideal, but then it could lead to something yeah, that's exactly right you don't know what it's going to lead to Aye. you don't know who's going to be in watching it Aye. you know and uh no that's that's absolutely bang on no that, that makes sense and it goes back to that that boy leaving that play you go down there you get, go. get referred to an agency away mm. you go you're away i also seen that you had popped up in doctor who yeah which must have been a because that's a huge huge program how did that come about how did you get the the call for that 
Uh, it's a guy called Andy Pryor who casts it. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's one of the top uh, casting agents down in London. And uh, I think he'd been trying to get me on it for for a wee while. Right. And uh, this part came up. It was a, I think it was a Friday. Friday afternoon. Phoned up my agent and said, look, this part, Commander of the St. Arms has come up with Johnny Tate for it. So my agent sent it on. I said, yeah, that's <laughs> absolutely. But I didn't know anything about Doctor Who. Right. So uh, I had to tape it that weekend. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, uh, I taped it they got it on the Monday and the d- deal was done by the Tuesday it was very very quick but I didn't know anything about it but my son he's quite a big Doctor Who fan mm-hmm. and uh, you know like, uh, no he's what age was he must have been 1920 when I did it right 20 and uh, so not really bothered about what's that, what dad's doing aye so I said look you, you help me with this tape read in these lines mm-hmm. he said what's it for I said Doctor Who <laughs> and uh, <laughs> said, what, 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 what part are you playing? I said, I don't know. Is it Commander of the St. Arms? But oh, oh my God! <laughs> Some fascinated and inter- interested in the career. <laughs> so, uh, what? I, yeah, so I, it, it was done pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was done over lockdown. Right. I did it. I worked on it. Uh, initially, it was a couple of eps, but they said, you know, the chance you're, you, you could be coming by. Obviously, if it. I made an ass of it. I wasn't coming Aye. back. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I worked on it on and off over the co- over the course of just mm-hmm. over a year. Right. I did four out of the six mm-hmm. in in Jodie Whittaker's final outing, uh-huh. and uh, I absolutely loved it. I was it was it. it was one of the best jobs. Uh, it was fantastic. They they were all good. She was she was brilliant. Yeah. She was absolutely fantastic. You know she made. You feel so welcome mm-hmm. and such an important part of it, you know, because you, when you go into these things, these big, big numbers, uh, you've got to hit the ground running. Yeah. And to do that, yeah. you've got to feel comfortable, you mm-hmm. know, and uh, and she was brilliant at that. Yeah. And I absolutely loved it. Mm-hmm. And it was because it was done over lockdown. I mean, I was going down, you couldn't take public transport. So I had to mm-hmm. drive down for Glasgow to Cardiff. And uh, I had a special letter. You know, in case I get stopped by the police, uh, let this man go on. <laughs> He's the commander of St. Arms. <laughs> I'm driving doing the M6 and M74 and M5. There's nothing in the road. That's, that's like part of the programme, isn't it? Aye, like... it was like, you know, like Armageddon. <laughs> so, no, I, abs- I, I absolutely loved it. And, uh, yeah, it was great. Must have opened you up to a new level of fanatic because there's there's a big cult following me. Well, I, I, do, the, I do the conventions. Yeah. And... Uh, I mean, uh, this I uh, actually know it was in February last year, so it's just over a year ago, I was invited to a massive one called Gallifrey, which is in LA. Right. So I was in LA for about a week. Oh, man. And, uh, and I'd worked with Sylvester McCoy, mm-hmm. one of the doctors. He was out as well. He was in the Three Sisters that I did at the Tron. Right. The Andy Arnold game. So I so I no Sylvester. So the two of us are together, mm-hmm. sign autographs. And this guy approaches me. Uh, big American guy, right. and he's uh, he's dressed as Jodie Whittaker, right? <laughs> he's got a beard now. He's got the he's got the blonde wig and the, the rainbow jumper, the long coat, and all that. And I'm going, all right, all right. and uh, and uh, he said, I know you do, and all this, and uh, you know, thank me for uh, you know restoring the Centurion Empire back to the rightful place in the universe, like that, no problem. And, uh, <laughs> and he said, I wonder if you would sign this for me, and I said, sure, I. He went to his coat and he brought out a box set of two doors down. <laughs> I said, you are fucking kidding me. He said, so he, he watched it in Britbox, so I had to sign it. So I said, is that not the programme that you're on? I said, yes, it is. <laughs> I was wondering what you were going to say there, but he was going to pull out his jacket. <laughs> no, it was a box set, trust me. I suppose as well, though, for you must see when you go into things like that, like the standards must be through the roof. For, for programs like that because it's a constant no the the, the you know uh the the standards are, are from you know it's no different and all these kind of things are pretty sort of even i mean even you know two doors down mm-hmm. similar you know that's yeah the, the production and production values and that and uh alan partridge do, mm-hmm. doing that it's all sort of similar yeah. so it's not really it's not i mean it's very it is very high standards and yeah. you know 
it's a huge amount of stake, but mm-hmm. uh, no, I never felt uh, phased or anything. Yeah. Uh, even although you know you turn around there's a Dalek there and <laughs> you're going I don't fucking believe this <laughs> at least you get brownie points for your son though at that point you're doing something cool exactly and plus I've got my own figurine oh brilliant as well so uh, that was uh, that was a uh, in fact I've got two because uh, one of the when I one of the the big episode I was in um, the the war of the, the war of the St. Arms mm-hmm. appeared in this horse right so the fans asked for another one with oh, uh, the horse. And, they, uh, and then the company that makes them, they went bust over COVID. <laughs> so there's about three million of me stuck on a horse, I think it's in a container in the Suez Canal somewhere. That be that means they've become rare, they've become collectors. Exactly. Items. I've got one of them. <laughs> <laughs> you might have the only one if I don't know where the rest are. Exactly. Brilliant. So two doors down. One of my favourite programmes on the telly. Good. How did it um what attracted you to it? What attracted you to take the part? Uh, well, what happened was uh, it started out as a one-off. Mm-hmm. People call it a pilot. It wasn't it a pilot? Right. It was a one-off. Uh, and I, 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 I'm I, not sure if this is true or not, but I always suspect that BBC One were let down by a big name right. in the approach to Hugman A mm-hmm. all these years ago. Because all of a sudden this slot came up between nine and ten o'clock and right. they had to fill it. Right. So my agent got a call. We'd I go down to London the next day to meet Simon Conlyle, who's mm-hmm. one of the writers, Simon and Gregor Sharp writer. Meet Simon, meet the director, meet mm-hmm. the producer right. at that time in London. Went down, met them, read a couple of scenes, mm-hmm. got in great with them, and the contract was done the next day. Right? And uh, we came back up the road and uh, the day, I always remember there was a bit of a hassle because um, they had to move the dates of only an excuse. Right, okay. Because they had already been set, mm-hmm. but they were told, no, you'll need to move the dates because he's got to do this. Right. So, um, and that, well, that was the, the BBC mm-hmm. said to them, you've got to. So uh, we did it in 10 days. Working from eight in the morning till eight at night mm-hmm. in a wee council house in Paisley. Can you swing a cat? <laughs> oh, huge crew. <laughs> and it was a good laugh to do. It was a good script. We mm-hmm. really enjoyed doing it. Good cast. And uh, and that was it. Yeah. It went out. And because of social media, mm-hmm. it just went nuts. Aye. And on the back of that, they came back and they said to Gregor and Simon, you think you could do a, a series of this? Mm-hmm. Of course they did. So that's that's how it all came about. Right. I mean, I was attracted to it because it was a good job. Aye. You know? Aye. And I knew, you know, I had a rough idea what the character was like. Mm-hmm. I thought, you know, you could have a bit of, Aye. Bit of fun with this. And uh, and people will relate. Everybody knows a guy like oh, that. Oh, 100%. You know? so, uh, so that's how that's how it came about. And it, it probably much the same as... There's only an excuse. It's you're into what season six now? Six. We start. Uh, I think we start filming seven May next year. So or maybe June next year. This year. So right. This year. From that starting episode, did you see it going seven seasons? No, I thought it. I thought it would go well though. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's been a slow burn, you know. Yeah. That's the thing. Uh, but uh, it's you know it's, it's certainly. I think lockdown. Uh, made a difference mm-hmm. people watching it and i played it's it's always somebody was telling me it's in about the, the top three programs mm-hmm. watched and i play every week Aye. uh it gets records great numbers and certainly over lockdown as well we attracted a new age group the 18 to 25s mm-hmm. which we didn't have before yeah and uh so it, and, i mean i couldn't believe it when i was for instance when i was down few years ago doing Doctor Who in Cardiff. Mm-hmm. You know, you were all masked up and everything like that. Stand at reception. You would barely <laughs> see my eyes and people are coming and going, excuse me, when's uh, when's two doctors coming back? And you're gonna So even there. Uh, and you know you that I mean I've done a lot of stuff that's on the network, but that more than anything yeah. has caught the imagination, mm-hmm. you know. But so. it's it's good as well though because it's it covers so many social aspects. 
as much as it's a comedy and, and it is a comedy, but when you watch it, it's all the wee things that go on in behind the scenes. Like even the Christmas one there with um in the coffee shop and she's having to spend Christmas herself. You don't think about stuff like that sometimes when you're, yeah. you're and you're you Very could be poignant. It is, yeah, it yeah. really was. Yeah. Um and it was a lovely performance by Lee oh. as well. So it was you know, it was uh, it was slightly different uh, as well because it, it you know it's uh, hit a new audience because it went to BBC One Aye. for for that mm -hmm. that show. And I, th I think that's what they're they're hoping to do. Aren't they? They're hoping to shift it. So I think when you know if they if they didn't know the program and they yeah. were to see it, what it's like, it's yeah. quite different from that mm -hmm. episode. But no, I thought uh, um, it it was it was slightly different, but it worked well. Yeah, and it's been like a natural. The way the the seasons have fell and the, the introduction of people like you had Grado and Joy coming in. Yeah, And it just kind of works. And it, I suppose that would probably help the younger dynamic as well because it yeah it's that kind of... Certainly, certainly Grado because he's so well-known, yeah. you know. And, uh, Aye. And everybody's been that young couple. Yeah. And you move somewhere yeah. and you don't know anybody. And the, and two, the, the two of them, are, they're, they're such good pals, but they're great Aye. as a couple. And mm -hmm. Joy's, Joy's a... She's a fantastic actress, right. you know. Uh, they're, they're they're absolutely brilliant together. Mm -hmm. But great, great. I mean, the la the laughs that we have, right. we, the, we do have a, we do. It's hard work. Mm -hmm. you know, you've really got to um, toe the line and all that. But we do have a laugh. And uh, great. I call him Graham. That's his proper name. Right. But Graham's great. I mean, you can, you know, big setup. You know, ten page scene, and you know, it's either me or Elaine has got the bulk of the dialogue. Mm -hmm. You know. So you've you don't want to mess it up. You're concentrating. Aye. You're thinking what's going on. You get all the last minute checks up. The camera's about to turn over. And he'll nudge me in the arm and go, "Dig him soon as." Shop. I suppose that is testament to your acting as well because I get so many people messaging going, "Ask him if he's really like Colin." Because it just seems to play that part. But thankfully, so naturally, Elaine, 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 and I did a thing recently <laughs> and they're like because elaine's known me since well i've not i've known her since she was about 17 18 Aye. i'm two years older than her mm -hmm. and uh she, she she was a year above me at drama college but I, i'm a couple of years older than her. and uh and she said she said you, you should know johnny is nothing like colin <laughs> he is nothing like him <laughs> so uh i know i enjoy doing it and i enjoy it my, my favorite one was the one that uh, did it years ago when he was, uh, when Cathy was away and he was, he was just in the pub for a week. He was, uh, steaming oh, the that's my favourite episode for Best Birthday. Best Birthday. Oh, man. Fish tea or something <laughs> like that. I love doing that. Love doing that. Yeah. Comes back in for the cake, waiting for your taxi outside. That's right. Oh, tremendous. Yeah. Absolutely tremendous. Good laughs. Um, summing up then, obviously, for, for anybody... A lot of people watch this at kind of school age, school leaving age, going to college or making their kind of choices. But from a from an acting point of view, is there any advice you would give to people based on your own kind of experiences through that that pathway? I I think you know if that's if that's what you want to do, mm -hmm. you know you've got to go for it big time. Yeah. You know, I I think it's you know looking back, I think it's a lot more difficult now mm -hmm. for for. Uh, young people coming into this yeah. industry but the plus point is i think there's a lot more work available yeah you know uh certainly in the in the film and in tv industry i'd be i mean i'm not i don't know the actual figures but i i would think there is a lot more um work available uh in in that area but if you if you want to do it then mm -hmm. you've got to go for it yeah. you know you've got to um i mean i always say it's, it's almost like running your own me business yeah do you know it's yeah. it's uh you know, and if you if you want to if you want to, if you feel that you're not getting a chance at a part in that, mm -hmm. then why am I not getting a chance in that? Yeah. What can I do to fix that? Mm -hmm. You know, you are you are in control of of your destiny. Yeah. At this point, you know, you can you can make the changes. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, you've just got to go for it. Yeah. And the th the thing I would also say is, you know, when you do do it, you know. You know, get as much work as you can. Don't yeah. pick and choose. Just mm -hmm. do it. Yeah. And you know, uh, 
you'll you'll benefit from the variety of things that you do as well. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, do theatre, do uh, a small scale tour, do a one one woman one man yeah. show, whatever. You know, try sketch shows. Try you know, do radio. Mm -hmm. Do all these things. Do as much as you can, mm -hmm. and just suck it all in like a sponge. Yeah, that's. Pretty much it. Sound advice. Well, I hope. <laughs> what's the what's the plans for this year? What have you got going on? Well, what I can tell you about yeah. is uh, <laughs> I am. Um, we're hoping to be doing a a seventh series of of two doors down. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's official yet, but I mean, <laughs> I'm writing the scripts. So I don't know why. Uh, so doing that, and then I, I, after that, I'm hoping to do uh, uh, some theatre work. Right. Okay. So. Uh, but there was three bits and bobs in between. There's a couple mm -hmm. other things that are still in, uh, in the often and that's so. Hopefully, see. back at Oran Moor this year potentially. I don't know. I don't know if I'll, if I'll go back. I mean, I get on uh, Jemima Levick, who runs it now. Mm -hmm. uh, Jemima directed me in a play. Well, she did. She directed Man's Best Friend that we did mm -hmm. uh, last year, but she also directed me in a play called Fibers, right? Which was about uh, asbestos poisoning and the impact and families particularly in in the west coast of scotland mm -hmm. and uh it, that was that was a fantastic job it was written by francis poet so i mean i will work with her again whether it'll be it or more yeah or not i, I yeah. don't know but that's uh, i would uh i would always say yes to yeah. anything that she approached me with but i mean thank you so much mate yeah, it's massively appreciated it's, it's been brilliant, it. been brilliant. thank you cheers yeah.